Well, ladies and gentlemen, our session is about to begin. Please have a nice seat. Thank you. Om Swastiastu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom sejahtera, shalom, namo buddhaya. Salam kebajikan, peace be upon you. Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, which attend both in online and offline. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second day of the second international seminar on fish and fishery sciences 2023. Please uh, give big round of applause to our togetherness here in the second international seminar on the second day. Well, this thing is guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm kindly to inform you that today's agenda will be divided into four sessions, which are keynote speech, panel session, parallel session, and closing session. In closing ceremony, we will announce best award of the second international seminar on fish and fishery sciences 2023. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we are entering the first session of today's seminar, that is to hear the keynote speech, which will be delivered by Dean of Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries Udayana University. His last education is PhD at Chiba University, Japan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Insinyur Iwayan Nuarse, MSE. Good morning, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen who are present in this room and join it online. My name is Iwayan Nuarsha from the Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries, Udayana University. The title of my presentation is The Role of the Remote Sensing and GIS Technology in Fisheries. Firstly, I would like to talk about what is the remote sensing and GIS. Remote sensing is the acquisition of information about the object or phenomena without making physical contact with the object in contrast to in situ or on-site observation. And the Geographic Information System, OGIS, is a tool that we can use to analyze spatial data, not only from the remote sensing, but also from, from the various to produce the useful information. What is the contribution of the remote sensing and GIS in fisheries? By using the remote sensing, it doesn't mean we can see the piece directly from the space or we can see the piece directly from the image. I don't think so. Remote sensing can detect and monitor the, bi the biophysical characteristic of the oceans or other aquatic resources and peace environments, including but not limit to. For the basic data, we can uh, detect the sea surface temperature sea surface height, sea surface salinity, sea surface chlorophyll, wind direction and speed and others. And uh, for the applications, remote sensing can be used for monitor and mapping of the seagrass, coral, coral reefs and others, mapping of bathymetry, mapping of spatial and temporal of upwellings, mapping of fishing grounds and also mapping of the estimated potential fishing area in the future. 
This is the several examples of the remote sensing satellite imagery commonly used for fisheries and marine application. For detect the sea surface temperature, we can use the NOAA MODIS, and for the sea surface height, we can use the Sentinel JSONs. For identify the sea surface salinity, we can use the Sex Aquarius. And for the winds, uh, direction, and speeds, we can use the Meteosat, Imawari. And for mappings, for the chlorophyll A, we can use seaweeds, aqua modis. And for the mapping of the seagrass and coral reef, we can use the Landsat. And for the mapping for the mangrove, we can use the sentinel and landsat as well. One of the important questions that need to be answered, that is whether the remote sensing is accurate compared with the field observations. A lot of research has been done to validate the accuracy of the remote sensing data by means of comparing the remote sensing data with the field observation. It is the example for the comparing the sea surface temperature obtaining from the remote sensing data with the field observation using the uh, buoy data. The research shows that the remote sensing data has the high accuracy compared to the field data. The coefficients of the determination so the accuracy and the root mean square to the error. In this picture, we can see the, the SST data validations with the Rama boy. And the SSH data with the tight data. In this picture, we can see the coefficient of the determinations is quite high, high and then the root mean square error is uh, quite low. This is the applications of the remote sensing data. This is the seasonal spatial distributions of tobalic surface water temperature and their trends based on Ceramodis from 2001 and 2021. And here we can see the differences between the lake sea surface water, lake water, lake surface water temperature in the daytime in the night time, that is that the lake surface temperature in the daytime is higher compared with the night time. And the lake surface weather temperature in the month of the March, April and May is the highest compared with uh, the other session. In the image on the right, uh, that is the trends of the lake surface water temperature during the 20 years. From this picture, we can see that there has been an increase in surface water temperature during during uh, 2000, 2000 years. I mean, uh, 20 years. This is the similar research uh, in. Uh, also leaks in the left side is the uh, dis distributions of the lake surface water temperature in the day times and the night times and the, in the right side is the differences uh, between the day times in the night time one of the most interesting uh, of this research is that there has been a decrease in surface water temperature in Pusulik during the 20 years. In contrast with the previous uh, slide in uh, Tobalik, this is uh, the interesting phenomena that needs uh, to be the further research. 
mangroves is uh, one of the important habitat for the certain fish. Remote sensing can be used for uh, mapping and monitoring of the density of the mangrove as well as the healthy of the mangrove. This is the applications of the uh, sentinels to imagery for mapping mangrove density in Tahura Ngurah Rai. Red color indicates the high density and the green color is the low density. Remote sensing can also be used for uh, mapping of bathymetry in shallow water. This is the study case uh, mapping of the bathymetry in shallow water in the Benoa Bay, Indonesia. In this picture, we can see the darker blue color is the default. This is the study about the integrations of the remote sensing and GIS to identify the suitability locations for fish apartments. In this study, use the three parameters, that is the bathymetry, the buffer from reaper outfall, and the seabed slopes. From this study, we can identify the best placements for the fish apartment placement. This is another application of the remote sensing uh, relationship between the sea surface temperature with the tuna catch. The sea surface temperature obtaining from the remote sensing data and the tuna catch uh, gets from the fisheries company. Uh, in this picture, we can see that higher sea surface temperature decreases tuna catch. This is the similar study relationship between the chlorophyll A with the tuna catch. In this study, we can say that the higher in chlorophyll A concentrations increase the tuna catch. Remote sensing data can also be used for mapping upwelling area distribution. This is the case study of analysis of uh, upwelling area distribution pattern in South uh, Indonesia using the MODIS image. Using the three parameters, winds, sea surface temperature, and the chlorophyll A. From this study, we can uh, say that the Requirements for the strong upwellings are SST less than 20, 27.66 degrees Celsius, Rolpel A greater than 0 0.35 mg per meter cubic, and speed and wind speed greater than 5.06 meter per second. Based on SST chlorophyll and the wind data, the strong upwellings occur on June, July, and August, and the peaks we found on August. This is the similar research was conducted in Southern Japan using the upwelling index. The results show that the upwellings occur in June until September the peaks on August in mostly longitudes. The remote sensing can also be used for mapping of big ice tuna fishing area. This study in the Southern Java and Bali Island. This study used the two parameter, that is the sea surface temperature and the chlorophyll A. And this is the results of the fishing area. This is the fishing area maps of big uh, tuna ice. In here we can see that the blue dots indicate the locations of the fishing area. And the red and uh, yellow uh, circle is the positive and high tuna catch. And here we can see that the uh, 
hikes and positive catch of the big size tuna mostly located in the fishing area. This is another application of the remote, sens uh, of the remote sensing uh, to determine the habitat suitability index for big size tuna. In here, use the three parameters, that, that is the sea surface temperature, sea surface chlorophyll, and sea surface hikes. In here, we can see the distributions and classifications of habitat suitability index. The red color indicates the high suitability, and the blue color indicates the low suitability. In previous study, in previous slides, the, the determinations of the fishing grounds is based on the past data. So the resulting of the fishing grounds is less useful for the fishermen. Therefore, we need to create the porkes fishing grounds maps for the future by forecasting the ocean parameter that determines the fishing ground. In this study, using the artificial intelligence, that is the deep land approach, approach using the long term long short term memory method. This is the result of the forecasting the distributions of the chlorophyll A in 2019 until 2020. And here we can see that the high concentrations of the chlorophyll A is found on uh, September, October and November and June, July and August especially in the coastal area. This is the comparisons between the predicted and actual chlorophyll A. And here we can see the uh, there, there are the synchronized about the predicted and actual chlorophyll A. Where is the correlations of the OR square is the hikes. The coefficient of the determinations is uh, in existence rings from the 0 0.83 until 0 0.96. In previous slides is the forecasting for the chlorophyll A and here the forecasting of the SST. The picture in the left side is the actual SST and the right side is the forecasting of the SST. And uh, from the forecasting of the chlorophyll A and the SST A, we can uh, create the map of the spatial distribution of the forecasting fishing ground. This is for the future. This is the results of the uh, forecasting of the fishing grounds of the big size tuna in the southern uh, water of Java Bali. And here we can see that the red color is the high potential for the uh, fishing grounds and the blue color indicate the low potential. This is the closing remarks of uh, my presentation. The first, uh, remote sensing NGS has an important role in fisheries, especially in terms of providing information about the biophysical environments of fish such as the sea surface temperature, sea surface height, sea surface salinity, chlorophyll A, wind direction, and speed. Remote sensing data has the high accuracy compared to the field observation data. Integrations of remote sensing and GIS can provide information about the ENSO, IOD, upwelling, fishing area, and other phenomena. That's all of my presentations. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, Professor Iwayan Nuar, for the keynote speech. Uh, we would like to ask you to stay on the stage because our organizing committee would like to present token of appreciation. Kindly be invited, Chairman of the Indonesian Ethiology Society, Professor Dr. Chris Mono, 
and also Chairman of Organizing Committee, Ibu Dr. Nyoman Dati Pertami, to present the tokens to our keynote speaker. Well, thank you. Please kindly take your position for taking the pictures. Thank you very much, Professor Nuarsa, Professor Chris Monon, and Ibu Dr. Dati Pertami. You may now take your seat. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please give big round of applause for our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Insinyur Iwayan Nuarsa, MSE. Well, this thing is guest participant, ladies and gentlemen. Now let us start the second session, that is a panel session. So now, without further ado, we will start the panel session. And allow me to now invite our moderator. She is a lecturer at Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries Udayana University. Her last education is PhD at University of the Ryukyu, Japan. So please invite her to the stage, our moderator, Ibu Dr. Widya Stuti Karim, MSE. Good morning everyone Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Om Swastiastu Shalom Namo Buddhaya uh, Welcome to the uh, invited speaker session uh, Once again, my name is Widya Stuti I'm your moderator for this session um, In this session, we have uh, Professor yes, Professor Hyun Woo Kim I'm sorry, I cannot see clearly the, the PPT. He is a professor from Pukyong National University of South Korea. And his specialty is uh, oceanography aquaculture and marine biology so good morning professor kim can you hear me um, i'm sorry i cannot clearly hear your voice okay. hello professor kim yeah okay i so, can hear you okay uh, great so um I like to ask you whether you want to present your uh, presentation directly. Yes. I mean by Zoom or yeah, by Zoom. Uh, I made a video clip. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So prior to your talk, I'd like to introduce your profile first. So. Can you see me my screen? Can you see me? Uh, I'm sorry, Professor, we haven't. Okay, yes. Now we can. Okay. Okay. Now we can see your presentation. Okay, let's start. So, uh, excuse me, sir. So actually, you have 
25 minutes uh, to deliver your talk. And okay. then we and then we have 10 minutes for discussion session. So time is yours. Thank you. Uh Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, nice to meet you. And today's the first of all, I'd like to give my special thanks to the faculty and the other staff members who prepared these special uh, international meetings. And I hope uh, this meeting will enhance our further collaboration between the Udayana University and uh, Pugyong National University. Since we share the common uh, interest in the fishery science, so collaboration between two universities will uh, be helpful for both faculty members and the students. And today I'd like to introduce or present a very short uh, presentation about my current research. So basically, I majored in the genomics. So once I come back from the United States, and then I uh, had a job in the Department of Marine Biology. And at that time of moment, uh, many professors uh, asked me to apply this kind of my current genomic uh, techniques to the currently used fishery science. So maybe 15 years of uh, contribution of uh, application of uh, genomic uh, tools to the fishery science now maybe very uh, became a very strong maybe tool to understand for the understand the fisheries or marine ecosystem and a strong tool for the not just for the scientists and also for the policy makers and uh, fishermen. Next slide. So food web structure is very complicated. So from the primal producer like a phytoplankton all the way to up to the top predator. So we have to understand for the scientific management of fisheries uh, science. So, however, the, to understand the food web is not an easy task. So, in Korea, the around the Korean Peninsula, the, we spend millions and millions of dollars to understand the food web structure around the Korean uh, peninsula. Then, uh, however, uh, the operating the ship, as you know, the it's highly expensive. So even though we spend a lot of money, and uh, what we been doing so far is the collecting the job plankton net, uh, collecting job plankton using the net, or taking water and to using the microscope to analyze the zooplankton, phytoplankton. This, this kind of uh, optical observations may be time consuming and, um, and also sometimes, you know, many those microscopic organisms has a different morphological, uh, characteristic. So even though recently they have some automatic uh, system to analyze the, those species, but each country has their own, uh, what it is, on their own uh, morphological characteristics. So 
it's not a easy task and it's very time consuming and labor consuming uh, task. So, however, due to the recent development of uh, next generation sequencing, the sequencing cost is dramatically dropped. So these days, maybe you can easily analyze the, your whole genome, which is the 3 billion base pair, just for the maybe $500. So due to the, those low cost, the, the technique we've been using We've been used for uh, human geno genomic human genomic analysis. Now can be applied for the environmental or fishery science. So that means those uh, labors and time consuming uh, task and the people, human resources and spaces and a lot of reagents can be saved. It's like a, you know, like a big data and fourth general um, industrial revolution. It are, it's also occur, occurring in the fisheries. So those large sample bottles can be transformed into the small, you know, microbials and stored in the minus 70. It can be stored, you know, maybe several hundred years as long as we have a, a suitable condition. So it's maybe very fascinating to see some analyzed, maybe 100, 200, you know, years old water sample. Maybe, maybe some later scientists may be very excited to see the any climate change or anthropogenic effect uh, stored in the refrigerator. And also another good thing is that about the um, metabolic analysis is to the numerical uh, factors, which is uh, like a big data. Uh, just uh, if we take a look at this, this is just a one-time observation, right? But uh, like a movie, if we analyze sequencing, hundred times with the various uh, time of series. It can be like a movie. So uh, we can maybe have a more precise, more accurate data can be obtained from the metabolic coding with a relatively low cost. It doesn't necessarily mean no cost, which is a relatively low cost. As you know, the next generation sequencing is still uh, costly for the single lab. However, the pipeline for the metabolic coding analysis is like this, just uh, collecting sample and then constructing library and uh, NGS analysis and identify species based on the bioinformatic analysis. Uh, here's some example of what we've done so far using the metaba coding or NGS analysis. Uh, first thing is to analyze the phytoplankton, which is the main primary producer in marine ecosystem. So we basically designed the primer based on the 23 of plastid uh, ribosomal RNA. That means we can specifically amplify uh, maybe photosynthetic organism from the mixture of just the water. So after designing this one, we can, this means we can quantify photosynthetic uh, organism. So Based on the 16S, which is a normally well-known uh, bacterial uh, bacteria, uh, component. So based on the quantitative PCR using the 16S and the 23S, we can see the 
both heterobacteria and then photosynthetic phytoplankton. So based on the QPCR, the result was uh, astonishing. So we can exactly detect uh, some spring uh, phytoplankton blooming. And also we can see the also some here, take a look at this, as the sunlight is strong, uh, different from Indonesia, Korea has a four season. So during the summer, and uh, as the sunlight is strong, most uh, phytoplankton move to the 20 meter, not just the surface water. We can s also see the migration of the uh, phytoplankton according to the different season. So it's very straightforward. And then it's very useful to transform the traditionally known, maybe <clears throat> spectral photometric uh, method into the molecular biological quantification method. So in different depths, uh, we were able to see the from the south to the north, we can see the some different amount of uh, phytoplankton and the microorganism and also relative amount of uh, phytoplankton based on com by comparing bacteria and uh, phytoplankton. So you can see the some southern part has higher amount of uh, <clears throat> bacteria and phytoplankton because in April in Korea it's a spring so water is becoming the warming warmer from the south and also we analyzed the bacteria and phytoplankton community based on uh, on the metabacodin analysis so you, we can see the the phytoplankton community is highly different from the surface water and the 50 meters in depth. This means uh, some water body is different from the surface water all the way down to the 50 to 100 meter. And in the June, uh, so as the water temperature increase, and then you can see the some phytoplankton structure is wider, and uh, but, but based on the due to the stratification, the surface water surface water has a narrower, and uh, most uh, phytoplankton are located uh, from the ten to maybe twenty meters in depth. So this is a very good uh, methodology to see the some phytoplankton community. Here's some, we also some analyzed that uh, phytoplankton community, then oh, we were able to see the cyanobacteria is the main uh, photosynthetic uh, main, uh, primary producer in June which is summer in Korea. So due to the, uh, as a result of a heat map, we can see the clear uh, changes according to the season. There's a March and April at the surface water and uh, June, May, June has a different uh, pattern. So what they, what we found is the, from the from the beginning of May, the water surface water uh, photosynthesis mainly based on the uh, cyanobacteria, not a large uh, phytoplankton. However, during the winter time and early springtime, their phytoplankton community is based on the chlorophyta. So, uh, by analyzing this. Uh, phytoplankton and microorganism structure, we can see the current status of the, the marine ecosystem. We also have some insight of the primary productions of a marine ecosystem. Uh, let's move to the uh, environmental bio uh, DNA. 
So when we just first introduced those techniques in Korea about 10 years ago, many people have been suspicious about these techniques. And then nowadays, many people just proclaim that uh, I'm the major in the environmental bio, blah, blah, blah. So I came to uh, realize that things changed in these days. So what it is eDNA? Many uh, Indonesian uh, researchers also know this, you know, techniques. So like, uh, you know, like a previous study, uh, maybe fish is continuously shedding of their DNA in the water. <laughs> so water actually represent the, their fish assemblies. So without any uh, direct catching or direct observation, by just the collecting water, we can see the fish assemblies at that uh, sampling site. This is the most revolutionary techniques. So for instance, for the river, which is a small ecosystem, for the uh, survey, here's a lot of, you know, they caught a lot of fish. And <laughs> this is another cause for the, uh, maybe destroying the habitat. But eDNA, just taking water. Okay. So there's no harmful effect on the uh, ecosystem, especially regardless of the river, the ocean is much easier. <laughs> no e impact on the marine ecosystem. So methodology is overall uh, same to the phytoplankton analysis. However, the primer is different. So primer and then uh, maybe bioinformatic analysis is uh, slightly different. But uh, due to the, the previously uh, renowned uh, faculty members in uni University of Tokyo in Japan, the Professor Mia uh, developed a, a fish-specific uh, universal primer which targeted uh, 12 S RNA rather than CO1, which is a well-known uh, primer. However, uh, I tried uh, many different uh, primer sets, but I found this currently, this primer is most reliable and feasible to, to understand the uh, fish assemblage compared to the other, uh, like uh, eco primer, any other fish specific primer have uh, some cross activity. So they not successfully uh, represented fish uh, species. When it comes to C, some uh, species identification, the my fish is uh, one of the reliable tools, I believe. So based on the my species system, we are able to see the uh, 9A species, one Korean uh, Gulf area. And the other Gulf area, we are able to see the 66 species. This is a pretty impressive that uh, just, uh, you know, water sample, we are able to see the almost 100, you know, 50 species based on the just the water sampling. And then this is useful to see the any endogenous species. On the left side, this is, uh, those are the, some one uh, Gulf specific uh, species. The other one is exclusively found in the, some of the other Gulf area. So I believe the, some my fish based uh, metabacoding analysis is a really reliable and feasible tools to identify the fish diversity of a certain uh, marine ecosystem. And based on the reader number, we are able to see some, where is the best place to detect this is, uh, uh, to detect those one species. So for example, two similar species, uh, we are able to study some main differences, okay, especially the, this species is exclusively found in the, some other Gulf area. And like a, a phytoplankton analysis, 
this is a uh, uh, fish assemblage in Korea also shows strong seasonal variations. And this is uh, what we expected. And this uh, graph shows the some correlationship among the different species. Here's here, this species is cold water like species, whereas the other four, five species is warm water like species. So we can see the some, you know, as the climate change, which species is decreasing, which species is increased, we can detect at a certain types of marine ecosystem. And also, uh, based on the primer what we designed, we uh, analyze ectoplankton. This is also very interesting uh, because without any uh, sorting out any fish larvae and egg, uh, right after fish uh, plankton, jaw plankton net, and then we can just homogenize and then using the some ichthyia plankton specific primer, and then we can identify the whole uh, larvae and fish egg based on the fish amplification. So we can see the lot of uh, fish egg just uh, simply uh, based on the metabacoding analysis. So we compared the, our result with the previously uh, known result. But this is stra strongly uh, similar to the previous result. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, some, some metabacoding analysis can be analyze uh, can be applied for the uh, food web study. So this is a Antarctic two species, which is most uh, one of most expensive fish species commercially. And this is exclusively uh, caught in the Antarctic area. But recently, many activists they argue that uh, maybe catching of this fish may affect on the marine ecosystem. So uh, we tested it, uh, so it's been uh, maybe seven or eight years to study the stomach contents. So previously, they detect uh, some, you know, fishy species, but they cannot identify the species. So they asked me to analyze the, some species level prey items. So we conducted a metabacoding as shown on the slide around the, all around the Antarctic area. So what we found, we uh, were able to isolate 99 haplotypes about and also 46 uh, gen genera, which is about the 37 species species. And what we found is that uh, those Antarctic two species presumably or preferentially uh, eat the uh, fish. So this is a fish virus species. And then those four species, including Kinobestis custuiti, Macros camel, Macros withany, are among the most uh, abundant prey items in that ecosystem. Then we found that uh, The prey item strongly represented the regional uh, fish assemblage. So since this is a uh, generalist predator and uh, Antarctic two species can represent some their fish assemblage. So for instance, 88.3, uh, regardless of year, they have a uh, Kinobestis gustuiti, the most abundant prey item, followed by the Macros common. However, 58.4, which is uh, the Wissani, is uh, the most top predator. However, 88.1 is uh, Cryodrive Antarcticus. So this means, so if we keep analyzing this uh, database, so maybe if we catch this fish, we can see the, any impact on the marine ecosystem of their habitat. So we also propose this differences of prey item can be influenced by the, their uh, physical oceanographic uh, characteristic, for instance, gyre. 
So those two highly closely related to two species prey item have a, a unique geographical uh, differences. So we can see that, okay, some Antarctic two species prey item can be affected by the some oceanographic influence. And also, we also uh, found some shell and slope, which means water depths may impact on the prey items. For instance, based on the metabarcoding analysis, we can see the some preferential uh, differences of a prey fish. That means uh, at a certain uh, water depths, okay, the Antarctic two fish preferentially eat this this fish. So that means uh, we uh, have to understand uh, maybe certain water depths. And then if we catch the fish at certain water depths, that can significantly impact on the certain species. So uh, maybe based on the statistical analysis, we can see the some uh, maybe short here some water depths and the reason are both in, are the, among the important factors of uh, Antarctic species. So we can provide the policy maker don't catch the uh, don't catch the fish inside of a ten thousand one thousand meter of a slope ridge. So outside is uh, less impact on the the slope marine ecosystem. So basically, uh, due to the time limit, I cannot interest all of my research. However, uh, this is all. If you have any question, uh, I feel free to answer about this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kim, for the fruitful uh, talks. So now we move to the uh, discussion session. So any question? Question. So actually, I'm waiting for another question. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, how about the committee? Should the should he come to the stage or? It's okay, I think. Maybe it's better to. Okay, Professor Kim, we have one question for you. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Kim. Hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me, Professor Kim? Yes, I can yeah. hear you. Yeah, thank you for the uh, insightful presentations. Uh, a very short question. My name is uh, Satya. You can call me Satya. A very short question uh, from your presentations. Uh, as we all know, that's a very uh, insightful presentation, uh, especially for the our participants, that mostly uh, students, undergraduate students. My question is, uh, as we know, uh, Eden is a very uh, useful advanced uh, methods for using uh, for analyzing biodiversity my question is do we still uh, need morphology morphological approach for biodiversity assessment from your uh, perspective yeah uh, thank you for very good uh, questions i think uh, can you hear me Yes, yeah. uh, crystal clear. Thank you for very uh, good questions. Uh, I think the we both studies should be conducted. First thing to do is morphological analysis of zooplankton and ichthyoplankton. Uh, maybe eDNA cannot see some any uh, maybe developmental stage of ichthyoplankton. Okay, so eDNA is more numerical. I think uh, maybe. The researchers and students should understand the eDNA can be presented as a, like, a, you know, 
numerical value. However, the still we still need some kind of uh, you know morphological analysis also should be conducted. For example, like uh, if we catch the some ichthyoplankton of tuna, but eDNA cannot describe the, how does the you know ichthyoplankton developmental stage things like that. Okay, so uh, and also maybe different developmental stage of uh, zooplankton, phytoplankton. So eDNA cannot answer all. Okay, so we should be uh, we should aware of that. Uh, no single technique can answer everything. We should collaborate each other. So we still need, uh, you know, strong, you know, co collaboration between the morphological scientists and the eDNA scientists. Yes. So in short, we still need uh, to combine both of these uh, methods for specific cases. Sure, sure. Yeah. We have a different purposes. Yes. Yeah, it's clear. Thank you, Prof Kim. Thank you. Okay, um, questions? I think uh, this is a very rare occasion, so I should ask something. Okay, Bapak, okay, please uh, come to the stage. Uh, Professor Kim, we still have a uh, sure. question. Yeah, uh, good morning, Mr. Kims. Hi. Hi. Hi my name is Tejas Mono from uh, Universitas Jambi, Departemen Biologi. My topic is about uh, DNA barcoding. And the next, uh, this year, I will uh, research about uh, ADNA. My good. question, uh, how many primer to detect uh, water? Until uh, reset the manifest in your uh, slides. Oh, so you studying the fish eDNA? Yes. Okay. Uh, there are different primer for their own purposes. If you'd like to for the just the species identification, so my fish, which is uh, developed by the Mia is the best. However, uh, if you'd like to study more in-depth studies such as uh, maybe population structure, uh, you should use the different primer. So there's no uh, single magic bullet to explain everything. So maybe it depends on the uh, maybe your research purpose. Another one is uh, we should uh, know that the regional or local reference sequence database should be constructed before applying for the environmental DNA. Because until now, the, our species identification has been strongly dependent just on the morphological scientist. However, the same morphological sci uh, uh, appearance doesn't guarantee that uh, you know same genetic information for instance for instance uh, you know maybe many uh maybe same species in the surabaya and the bali lombok has their own different genetic structure so maybe surabaya scientists make their own local or regional dna sequence database however the bali and lombok uh, and those researchers it's better to construct their regional local DNA database. So this is more important because until now, the fisheries management have been based on the morphological analysis. Same species doesn't necessarily mean the same uh, ecological, same fisheries meaning. Maybe, maybe even though same species, according to the genetic structure, they have a different, you know, migration pattern, different spawning time. So 
maybe uh, we should uh, manage the you know spe uh, any fisheries based on the dna base not a species based uh level can you understand okay i understand yeah thank you Mr. yep uh, thank you pak maybe to simplify a uh, different primer for different purpose if i'm not mistaken so actually we have uh, one question from the uh, chat box in the zoom prof kim so it's from uh, ibu selia hermawati so if we have problem to uh, to identify uh on the species level i mean some of the otu only detect until family level or unknown do you have any solution <coughs> or suggestion for this case yes uh, uh uh that's pretty good question some of i think this question maybe come from the those who had uh, experience uh edna one time uh first of all like i mentioned before please construct a local regional uh, reference database first and then the, due to the uh, short fragment size of my piece, my piece is only 170 base pair. So sometimes uh, like a rock fish and the fugu and the, some flat fish. So they have a low uh, genetic variation level. So uh, my piece cannot discriminate correctly uh, just by the those uh, short sequence. So uh, it's pretty uh, strongly recommended to construct a regional local database okay to see the some any species level okay for instance if you have a two or three candidates with the same sequence maybe for instance in your in your local uh, site but however as long as you have a local database you know uh, which is among the three uh, potential uh, species, you know which one is which. Is that an answer for you? And then also I got another question from the chat. I think cross reactivity of the primer. Okay. So cross reactivity. Oh, I have a more. I think I have too many questions. I think it's another one is uh, cross reactivity so you have to have you have to set up the some proper pcr condition if you uh, decrease the pcr temperature too low the, you have a lot of cross reactivity so the successful uh, edna research should be based on the proper pcr condition okay so my piece even though they have uh, recommend 50 uh in celsius but uh, i usually a little bit increased my temperature because it's lower uh, cross reactivity to the other you know species and then eden how the lots of uh, fishes oh edna sometimes some people said the edna produce higher higher number of species than directed catch uh, this is a uh, main very reasonable because uh, not a single catching method is uh, you know perfect maybe auto trail troll and any other gill lad each you know uh, catching method has their own preference okay so edna uh, maybe if you uh, find some paper which compare the fishing method and the eDNA uh, catching rate, but uh, maybe eDNA is a much higher number of, uh, uh, you know, num the fish species identified, but we should be very careful. Some people think that eDNA analysis is a simple task. This is not a uh, reality because eDNA is a very tiny amount of trace, you know, DNA from the seawater. So the environment of a lab environment should be very restricted and then uh, maybe highly controlled. 
so that there's no contamination, cross contamination across the sample. So if there's no specifically designed uh, facility, so you can easily see the cross contamination of each water sample. Okay, so you can easily see some, you know, uh, marine fish from the lake sample, something like that. So uh, maybe eDNA analysis uh, should be conducted in very highly controlled um, lab condition. So for instance, in my lab, uh, maybe sample filtration and uh, DNA isolation and the PCR are all conducted in separate different uh, aerated room. And end of the experiment, we use the Clorox treatment so that they have no cross reactivity. So this should be very careful. So eDNA, I, one more time, I stress, I'd like to stress that the eDNA analysis is a very tightly, you know, controlled experiment. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kim, for the uh, interesting discussion and all the participants. I'm afraid uh, we have very limited time, so we have yes. to end this, this session, I mean. Okay, so thank you, thank you to sum up um, for the future research. Um, so eDNA and um, e -bar e meta coding, environmental eDNA is a powerful tools to uh, identify our current uh, environmental status for the both marine and uh, freshwater uh, and ecosystems. But of course, it's not a perfect tool. So just like what Professor Kim mentioned before, we need to more collaboration in this uh, field. And also for the local, we are local researcher. We need to build or construct our uh, local database okay uh thank you again for your participation and your uh, enthusiasm in this session see you all at different session thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much professor kim for your excellent contribution and also thank you our moderator ibu dr widya stuti we would like to ask you to stay on the stage and also, uh, I would like to uh, inform that Professor Kim, uh, please kindly uh, remain on your skin be, uh, or your screen because we would like to uh, present token of appreciation. The first A certificate is given to Professor Hyun Woo Kim from Pukyong National University. Once again, thank you very much, Professor Kim from Pukyong National University. And also, uh, next, kindly be invited Secretary General of the Indonesian Ethiology Society, Bapak Dr. Charles Simanjuntak. And also, Chairman of Organizing Committee, Ibu Dr. Nyomandati Pertami, to present the tokens to our moderator for the first panel session. Well, once again, please kindly take your position and also I would like to invite Professor Kim to uh, turn on your camera screen for taking the pictures. Well, thank you very much once again, Professor Kim from Pukyong National University. Thank you very much, our moderator. 
Nosso Bapak Dr. Charles Sen, Ibu Dr. Dati Pertami. Well, Excellencies, Distinguished guest participant, ladies and gentlemen, we are now still together on the second international seminar on fish and fishery sciences. And we are entering the next session. There is the second panel session where we'll, uh, we will hear from two panelists who are experts in their respective fields. Our panel session will be moderated by a moderator. She is a project manager at Yayasan Biodiversitas Indonesia. Her last education is Master of Science in Master Program of Biology Postgraduate Program Udayana University. And she will guide the conversation and also invite questions from the audience or participants. So allow me now to invite our moderator. Please welcome Ibu Niputu Dian Pertiwi, MSI. Thank you, Master of Ceremony. Good morning, all of the honorable speakers, uh, distinguished participants and guests. Ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, uh, I am Dimputudian Pratiwi. I will be your moderator for today's sessions uh, in the second international seminar on fish and fishery sciences, ISFFS 2023. In these sessions, we shall have two outstanding presentations from our prominent invited speakers, whom I believe shall enrich our insight and knowledge regarding the theme of this conference. Before we begin the presentations, allow me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Samantha Cheng. Okay, Dr. Samantha Cheng, she is the Director of Conservation Evidence Global Science World Wildlife Fund, or WWF. She completed her PhD in University of California, Los Angeles, majoring in biology in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Dr. Samara Cheng is also focusing her work on data visualization and database creation, monitoring and evaluation evidence assessment. Good morning, Dr. Sam. Can you hear our voice here? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay. Um, I would also like to um, introduce our second invited speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Insignor Luki Adrianto, MSJ. Professor Luki is a policy analyst and researcher focusing on fisheries and aquatic resource governance. He is also a professor in Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Sciences, IPB University. Professor Luki completed his doctoral degree at Kagoshima University, Japan, majoring in fisheries and marine resource policy. Um, is Professor Luki already in the room? Good morning, Professor Luki. Nice Good morning. to have you here. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, thank you, Professor. And now, uh, before the presentation begins, I would like to address that in this session, each speaker will have 25 minutes to present the topic and then continue with the panel discussion for 10 minutes. And without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Saman Cheng, who will be presenting the topic about from squid to impact evidence informed conservation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Samantha Cheng. Uh, Dr. Sam, the time is yours. Dr. Sam? Thank you. Sorry, I had a, a mute challenge. Um, hello, everyone. Selamat pagi. It's nice to see you all virtually. Thank you for having me. Um, I will just share my screen quickly. Okay, um, so I believe you should be able to see 
uh, that now. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Dianne. Um, as Yan said, my name is Sam Cheng. I'm the Director for Conservation Evidence with the World Wildlife Fund's Global Science Team. And today I'm going to be talking about the journey from understanding squid biology and, and squid population um, to figure out how we create better systems in conservation and natural resource management to understand the impact of our work and to improve the effectiveness uh, of management over time. So just to start, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the World Wildlife Fund. Um, so WF has hundreds of offices around the world um, that form a network. And these offices work individually and together to really work to develop strategies, um, implement programs, and collaborate and partner with different countries and organizations and communities to get to a world where people and nature can uh, thrive in harmony. And so the portfolio of WF's work uh, focuses on six different areas, uh, forests and freshwater, oceans and wildlife, uh, and climate and food. And to do this work, the Global Science Recording in progress is a team of scientists that spans the entire network. And our aim is to deliver evidence-informed solutions so that we can conserve biodiversity, so we can halt environmental degradation, we can address climate change, and we ensure human well-being. So across these different areas, the global science team is comprised of different scientific experts and support and technical expertise to really try and bring together the best available science, data, and data systems to address the pressing questions that we're trying to answer in all of these different fields. So, so my job at WDF, oh, I think we stuck. There we go. Um, so my job at WDF is across all of these different areas. My background is as a marine scientist, but the work I do really focuses on developing systems for monitoring, evaluation, and learning, and for improving the use of evidence in the way that we make decisions in conservation and natural resource management. So what is MEL then, um, or monitoring, evaluation, and learning? It first really focuses on trying to understand what data do we need to gather about how we're implementing different types of projects or programs, what happens after we implement those projects and how is this leading to the change that we want to see for nature, climate and people, um, whether we're working in fisheries management or in marine conservation um, or, you know, in ecosystem restoration. The second part of monitoring, evaluation and learning is the evaluation part of it. So how do we take that information that we've gathered through monitoring, um, through assessments, to really understand how effective are these projects towards achieving these objectives that we've set. And then perhaps the most important part about this process is making the time to actually learn from that information. So now that we know whether or not it's effective, how it's effective, how it actually might work in different places, how do we use that information to adapt our program, to adjust our strategies, and to define our priorities as the world changes and to be able to adapt and be resilient to that. So organizations all have different types of MEL approaches and MEL practices. Um, we try and draw from research. We try and work with local communities. We try and work with governments to make sure that the systems that we're setting up to understand the progress and the process and the impact of our work is sustainable. So in order to do that, we really do need systems for managing that knowledge, we need to really focus on and support collaboration and that dialogue. Um, I really appreciated what Professor Kim said earlier that you know one thing is not the answer to everything. We really need to focus on collaboration and I'll build on some of those themes in this talk so that we can have learning that is inclusive but also allows us to learn over time. So the second part of my job that I had mentioned is around evidence, both in the generation of evidence about the work that happens on the ground and how change is occurring in natural systems, um, and also in the use of evidence. How do we take all of that evidence that's being produced through research um, that exists in different types of knowledge 
and bring it together in a way that is usable and relevant to decision makers. So evidence comes from lots of different places. It comes from research, it comes from project evaluations, it comes from you know, uh, working papers and reports that come out of uh, organizations and governments and institutions. And it also comes from individuals and communities in the form of indigenous, traditional and local knowledge. But we know that not all knowledge is of equal reliability or relevance to inform different types of decisions. Um, so what we need to do is really bring that information together and to do it in inclusive and, a tra and transparent ways so that we can make sure that we're accounting for potential bias in that information, um, that we reduce the likelihood of failure in designing something that's based on maybe faulty or missing information, um, and that we really do in a way that allows us to learn about what is happening and learn from what has already been done. But, you know, I think it's one thing to think about what does the evidence say, and it's another thing about how does evidence actually factor into the decision making process. We know that, you know, decisions are influenced by lots of different things, not just what the science um, or the data says. It depends on what we value as a society. Um, what are the priorities perhaps for a government? Um, it also relies on knowledge that maybe isn't published. Um, that's more about experience, knowing what sort of issues and factors are. And it also depends on the context. So in order to get to this middle part, the evidence-informed practice, we need ways that really can bring together the best available information and knowledge and be able to really combine that with sharing and collaborate knowledge sharing and collaboration and dialogue so we can actually make sense of that information in the context of a decision or a scenario so at wf i lead the conservation evidence team um, we sort of develop our um, our efforts and our approach based on three different pillars and i'll build on some of these throughout the talk and sort of explain how these manifest in practice um, the first is really on ensuring that the evidence that we have is robust and it's credible, meaning it's grounded in that best available knowledge. It allows us to understand how change happens across different scales, but really is relevant to specific contexts. So for example, you know, knowledge that about and research about fisheries management in Oregon, where I live in the US, may not be relevant for fisheries management, for example, in Bali and vice versa, but figuring out how those two might link together really comes into that second pillar on the bottom of collaboration and inclusion. You know, I think there are lots of communities of practice out there um, in lots of fields in conservation and the, in natural resource management, lots of different types of practitioners, uh, researchers, um, and actors here that have different perspectives. And so to bring those together requires making time for that dialogue um, and making time for that learning. But then practically, the tools and the approaches that we develop and the data sets we try and bring together, we need to make sure that they're practical and they're efficient. Oftentimes, we have really complex methods um, that are exciting, perhaps from a research perspective, um, or they're really exciting because they leverage new technology like artificial intelligence um, and machine learning. We have to make sure they're actually feasible for, you know, for example, for one of our field teams. Uh, who might be working in a place with low internet connectivity um, and making sure that they really meet those teams where they're at with the right time and the right resources to be able to either use that information or collect that kind of information to understand um, their impact. So all of this coming together, um, how does this relate to what I said at the beginning that this was talking about from squid to impact? Um, so for me, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my own experience and journey uh, from working as a researcher and pursuing my graduate degree and sort of talking about that early career stage um, and how that's led to the work I do now with WWF. So when I was doing my graduate work, I was really focused on trying to understand how different types of genetic tools um, could help inform fisheries management. Um, at the time, I really focused on population genetics and population genomics and trying to understand what kind of information that these kinds of methods could provide to inform 
planning and implementation of fisheries for long-term sustainability. So at what point could these tools let us know what to catch, when to catch it, where to catch it, and how much, right? Sort of focusing on those main areas of, of fisheries management um, understanding. And at the time when I was working uh, primarily in the Indo-West Pacific, um, in the Coral Triangle, uh, being based out of Indonesia, one thing we were seeing was that as finfish fisheries were crashing, there was more attention being paid to cephalopod fisheries and squid fisheries in particular, as you can see here on this graph and starting in around 2000, that increasing uh, capture of cephalopods. But one of the challenges for cephalopod fisheries management is that most species that were caught were only identified to that class level. So just to the cuttlefish, octopus, and squid. And squid make up the majority of cephalopod catch. But we also saw there was a large portion of catch that was coming in that was just unidentified. They were generic cephalopods. And so there are a lot of questions starting to emerge about what kind of, of species are we even catching? How can we use that information to understand fishing pressure? And where might we need to change the way we manage or, or modify the way we manage these fisheries to ensure their long-term sustainability? So I focused on uh, lolliginid squids. These are nearshore neuritic squids living over the continental shelf. And they typically have a single terminal reproductive event uh, after which the squid uh, usually break down and, and die. Um, so the fishing pressure tends to occur around these spawning aggregations. So understanding the characteristics of those spawning aggregations, what species were spawning, when they were spawning, where they were spawning, uh, was really critical. And for the group that I worked on for sepia toothis, we knew there was a lot of potential cryptic species that were out there. Sepia toothis is a widely distributed species. It occurs throughout the Pacific Indian Oceans, as well as the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. And there hasn't been good consensus about how many species might be there or whether they are in fact all one. And within that, those species, what the population structure might be like, so we could better understand spatial and temporal management um, of those fisheries. So in order to do this work, um, I used a lot of different methods, um, both field sampling as well as uh, sampling in markets, uh, working with collaborators at the uh, Universitas de Aquala, as well as Universitas Udayana, um, to both take morphometric measurements, to conduct um, field surveys, to look at behavior, as well as collect tissue samples, um, to look at population genetic and genomic and phylogenetic analysis. Um, here, apologies for my awful looking face. <laughs> um, and what we ended up finding was that for sepia toothis, they had very complex population patterns. Of the squid that we looked at and the areas we looked at in the coral triangle, there were two very similar species that occurred in the same place that had sympatric distributions. They were found in the same habitats. Um, but when we looked closer, we found that one of those species showed a population genetic pattern indicating that it was a very limited disperser. Um, Whereas the other showed patterns um, of genetic connectivity patterns that were more closely similar to more mobile pelagic species. Um, so really trying to get at these questions of what are the barriers to gene flow and to dispersal and how can we use that information to better understand how we manage it. What this information told us was that these two species live in the same place. They likely are harvested in the same way. They are often probably targeted by the same fishery. And they're really hard to tell apart morphologically. Um, but we know that they have probably very different life histories, which would mean they would have been managed in different ways. So that's a lot of really compelling information um, that we thought was really important to communicate to the various different agencies and groups that were working in cephalopod fisheries management across the Coral Triangle. But as we started to talk with different management agencies and representatives, we quickly realized that there's a lot more information that needs to be considered than just the genetic patterns. We needed to be able to combine that data with the ecological, the biological, and the social data 
which we started to do by collecting information about behavior, about morphology, about um, potential diet. But we also need to make sure that we had that information from all areas of their range. And so really required increasing our collaboration with other researchers um, and management agencies who are trying to look at these species. We also need to make sure that we were really meeting decision makers where they were at. So a lot of the decisions around fisheries management are not just informed by the scientific research. They're also informed by politics. They're also informed by different social values that people might have. So for example, for the work that I did um, on squid fisheries in California and the US, it's a very, very valuable fishery. It's a very high economic importance for the state and for the country. And so any information that might change the way that the, manage, the squid were managed ran into a lot of negotiation with you know, representatives from the fishers, representatives from the different commercial areas. Um, and so it's trying to work through that. And what we discovered in Indonesia was, was two things. One, there was a lot of information that we were not connecting with um, in terms of the local and traditional knowledge of fishers and the knowledge about when different types of squid that corresponded to our cryptic species that we found were coming in, different characteristics that they could describe but were not captured in any way. But when it came down to it, the information that we needed wasn't just the genetics because we needed to make sure that that information had somewhere to go, that someone could actually use it. And for a lot of managers and management agencies, they didn't have the capacity to act on that because they had low capacity to even check what squid were coming in and being landed. And so that information oftentimes just kind of sits there. So that really led me to the next portion of my career because I started asking, well, what kind of information is most relevant to inform different types of conservation decisions when we know that decision makers have lots of other things they need to consider and lots of other um, challenges to be able to actually use this information. So first, how do we know when conservation is working, right? When, our, when our, um, the things that we're implementing are actually working and how do we ensure this information can be used? So I just wanna zoom back out for a minute um, and sort of put us in the context of today. We are at a time when action to address these global challenges for nature, climate, and people are extraordinarily pressing. They're very immediate. And there are lots of global um, frameworks and um, initiatives and commitments for climate change, the IPCC, for nature, for the global biodiversity framework and for people for the sustainable development goals. So if we want to understand whether or not our work is contributing to making progress, whether the work happening in our country is making uh, is making contributions to this uh, to these global goals, we really need to understand what data we have and how that data can help us understand what is happening and what we do with that information. So we're at a really exciting time. Um, in, I guess, in science and in data production, where the production of data and knowledge is exponential. We have automated systems like satellites and remote sensing to almost collect data in real time about the world. We also know that scientific knowledge is doubling almost every nine years. But at the same time, the types of decisions that we're trying to make, as I just described earlier, are increasingly complex. We're trying to achieve lots of different things together. And so that requires us to be more thoughtful about these different ways of knowing, trying to understand which perspectives need to be in the room to make those decisions to decide what kind of information is actually going to be useful and relevant um, to these situations. So in the last bit of this talk, I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the work we've been doing to bring together that information. So going back to the beginning of this talk and, and trying to understand what do we know already and how can we use that to inform um, conservation and natural resource management. And the first area is really trying to support the synthesis, the review of uh, this knowledge. So 
in the environmental field, there's been a rise in the use of systematic evidence synthesis. There's been a lot of interest in this really broad range of methods um, that have lots of strengths and weaknesses depending on what you want to use it for. Um, but in general, uh, these are robust and systematic methods. Um, they can be socially inclusive, meaning that lots of different stakeholders can and should be engaged in the process of deciding what is the question that we're asking, that we want to find evidence to help us understand. Um, they use systematic and transparent and reproducible methods, uh, meaning we can update these reviews and syntheses over time as new information emerges. And they're really trying capture a comprehensive or representative body of evidence to really capture all the elements um, that are important to understand the question. So a lot of my work over the past 10 years has been focusing on understanding what evidence exists on the links between nature and people. Uh, the topic areas have really varied, but a lot of this work has been carried out with the Science for Nature and People Partnership, which is a partnership of three um, conservation NGOs as well as with Conservation International, and then working with different groups uh, from the World Bank to um, and other bilateral and multilateral donors, um, as well as with conservation organizations and government agencies to understand where do we have data gaps, where do we have knowledge gaps about some of these links that might indicate areas that are um, more uncertain, where we need to generate more information. Those are really research gaps that we need to work and partner with the research community to produce. And so through a lot of this work, we've built um, different ways of engaging with organizations to be able to use the insight from this work to inform where they prioritize their funding, where they prioritize um, monitoring and evaluation, and where they prioritize research. So if you're interested in using this kind of method, um, systematic maps, systematic reviews, um, and other types of rapid evidence methods, I would encourage you to look at the standards that are published by the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence. Uh, this is a network of centers around the world um, that set the methodological standards for conducting evidence syntheses, as well as um, feature syntheses that have been conducted in methods and guides um, through the Environmental Evidence Journal. So the other part of this work is not just conducting the syntheses, but helping others do it. Um, so really trying to improve the efficiency by which we do this work. Um, one is through a tool called Colander. Um, it's a open source web-based machine learning platform for conducting document synthesis or literature reviews um, that helps users go through it faster to find those most relevant things sooner. And then the second is really helping people use the results of this synthesis. Um, we have a number of different projects that have explored using user-centered design to visualize data from these maps so that people can explore them, filter them, and find the information that's most relevant to their area. Um, and then the third is building a community of practice around using uh, these different types of methods and developing practical guidance for those in conservation development and environmental organizations. Um, this is the Rapid Evidence Assessment Methods um, group that's led by the EPA, uh, along with a number of different organizations, uh, the U.S. Environment Protection Agency. And then the other part of this sort of ecosystem of um, evidence use is trying to connect evidence producers or evidence generators, like researchers, uh, with evidence users uh, not through synthesis, by, but by really creating that collaboration process and connecting people through it. So I talked at the beginning about the importance of monitoring impact. And oftentimes, this conversation starts with what should we be measuring? Um, how should we measure it, right? Focusing on the indicators of change. But what's more important that we've been trying to develop approaches and tools to help people um, really ask better questions. Try and understand if we measure all this information, what are you going to do with it? What is it going to help you do? What, what is it going to help you do? And why do you need to know it? And part of this process is ensuring that we know who is asking the question. Who's going to use the information? Are those the people, the right people in the room? Do we need to have other perspectives? Um, and then we can really get up to that point of 
figuring out how we do it practically, um, figuring out how to do this cost efficiently and freeing up time for, so they can actually free up the time to adapt and learn. So part of the work we're doing now at WF is really trying to leverage artificial intelligence or remote sensing um, to help us figure out what we should be monitoring and how we should do it so that we can be as efficient as possible. So I'm just gonna skip over this for a second here. Um, I've talked a lot about evidence-informed practice, um, but I think the one thing that I wanted to provide as a key takeaway, or at least my key takeaway from uh, my experience is that getting to evidence-informed practice is, is an iterative process. And what's really key is that collaboration and that learning because we are all working in these ecosystems and we need to figure out ways that the work we're doing can actually sustain them and that our work can be sustained. Um, and I think this is really important um, in the context of this study I wanted to share. This was some work that was done by a large collaboration of conservation, um, sorry, coral reef scientists, researchers around the world, because we wanted to understand who's doing research in coral reef science. Is it the people who are actively working in these places? or you know, who's being represented. And what we found by looking at about 15 years of research in coral reef science is that only 4% of authors in 2003 were from non-OECD countries. And so based on the trajectory and that, that trend we saw, by 2046, only 50% of people publishing in coral reef science were expected to be from non-OECD countries. I mean, the field is still really dominated by research emerging just from a few places around the world. But that's, that's an issue because the coral reefs around the world oftentimes do not occur in those places. And so there's a mismatch between where the research is happening and the research funding potentially is coming from and where the research is actually conducted. And this is not, in my perspective, is not a sustainable way of, of, of conducting research. It's not a sustainable way of, of informing conservation and natural resource management because there is a disconnect between where the decisions are being made and the communities that are affected and the researchers who are doing it. Not to say that there aren't connections to be made. Thus, my concluding point here is that it's really important, obviously, to use evidence in the way we make decisions, but part of that process is really connecting and convening those stakeholders and tools to make sure that the right collaborations are in place, the tools meet people's needs. So it's not just about what we do, but how we do it and who's involved. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, I will take questions, I think at the end, and I hopefully will be able to answer them. In the meantime, please put any questions in the chat in case I cannot stay for the panel. Thank you, everyone. Rumikasi. Hey, thank you for the interesting and Recording informative uh, presentation, Dr. Sam. And we will have uh, panel discussions at the end of the uh, talk after our second speaker. And we really hope that uh, you can be there at the panel discussion sessions. Uh, can you hear my voice? Dr. Sam? Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, Sam. Okay, now uh, we will continue our session with our second invited speaker, Professor Dr. Insignor Luki Adrianto. As I mentioned before, Professor Luki is a policy analyst and researcher focusing on fisheries and aquatic resource governor. Governance. He is also a professor in Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Sciences, IBB University, and he completed his doctoral degree at Kagoshima University, Japan. And his areas of ex expertise, including social ecological system approach to aquatic resource, integrated coastal management, and also fisheries socioeconomic. Good morning, Professor Luki. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Or uh joining with a very important uh, seminar today thank you very much okay, okay professor luki now uh ladies and gentlemen uh we will uh please doctor professor luki sorry to give uh presentations 
Uh, Professor Lucky, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, moderators. Uh, I'd like to share, uh, uh, I think following up the uh, last or uh, some slides of Sam's uh, previous presenters related to the uh, connecting not only the genetic, but also perhaps the other information, including the human dimension of the physical medicine. So that uh, following with the uh, uh, main topics of this uh, this year seminar, that actually the keyword is the resilience of the fisheries and the blue economy. I would like to share the perspective of the how to manage the resilience of the fisheries toward uh, blue economy transformation, of course, and then uh, specific in the case of Indonesia. And I would like to uh, also uh, using the socio-ecological system approach as uh, now I'm uh, very passionate to use this approach uh, in managing the resilience of uh, fisheries, especially in the context of Indonesia. I'll start with the what's the blue economy, uh, what's going on with that. I think it's not that uh, really uh, uh, many slides on that, but I just try to put some refreshment on that. And but then I will also follow in with the contact of fisheries and blue economy transformation. And uh, by using that uh, first and second uh, topics, I would like to continue with the managing resilience of uh, fisheries, especially the small scale fisheries related to the blue economy in Indonesia. And I will I will end with some of uh, closing remarks. But before I uh, continue, I would like to also express my grateful thanks to the all of the uh, organizers, especially the Indonesian Society of Ecology, uh, University of Indiana, other collaborators to uh, when when uh, I got the invitation to to, to come uh, and join online in this uh, uh, statistics seminar. I'd like to express uh, my gratitude. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, the organizers. Well, uh, I will start with this. As as some mentioned, that actually the the fisheries is not only the fish, yeah, right? And that, that's why actually I very happy with the seminar or symposium on fish and fisheries because we thought human dimension is not fisheries. Uh, it's, it's only fish, then only fish. Using the fisheries or forestry, for example, or or agriculture, actually is the the human dimension. That's why actually human inclusive uh, ecosystem is very important in the context of the. Uh, uh, managing the resilience of fisheries, and I think uh, this is my 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 uh, starting point of view related to the sustainable of fisheries, especially in the context of tropical countries like Indonesia. So human is integral part of the fisheries. The second one, I would like to go to the blue economy. What's the blue economy? Well, uh, in my uh, perspective, uh, there is ecosystem supply and ecosystem demand. So I think. Uh, in the context of ecosystem science, uh, is, they, they will be something like the aquatic ecosystem as the system, which is have like services, you know, like for provisioning, uh, cultural uh, uh, regulating and supporting. But then because of that service, there is a demand and demand connected with the human dimension or we call it economic system. In that context, resilience is very important because then when the demand is access the supply and then the problem is the sustainability. But then if that only supply without the demand, then also not efficient ecosystem. So that in that context, I think the uh, balancing between the ecosystem supply and demand is very important in the context of the complex Antarctic system like fisheries in our country. And some of the example in my research using that framework actually uh, is the backbone of the blue economy in my perspective. For example, like, Blue economy itself is very debated, uh, debatable concept. But I think in this uh, seminar, I would like to uh, concern that blue economy is aquatic system-based economy which uh, implement the sustainability principle. Because I don't, I don't want to uh, go to the debatable things. But some 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 groups mentioned that blue economy is the environmental paradigm, the extended the, blue, the green economy. And some groups also mentioned that uh, blue economy is the ocean-based economy. But and then I, I try to combine between the, those two paradigm, paradigm that blue economy is the aquatic system-based economy, which uh, uh, apply the sustainable principle. And this uh, operational division that I use in the context of blue economy. And this is the sum of that I mentioned: some of the operational definition, uh, 
uh, ASEAN Declaration of Blue Economy. Next month, I would like to go to the Blitung for for discussion with the ASEAN Blue Economy Group, for example. And they use uh, something like this: that sustainable ocean, uh, all economic ac uh, related activities with the ocean, and something like that. And this is the blue economy spectrum, and fisheries is part of this, right? I mean, for example, like the first one, the first thing, and of the marine living resources is part of the of the blue economy. So, blue economy is not only the fisheries, but without fisheries, there is no blue economy. So that I think uh, we, are, as the fisheries scientists, actually would like to have like confidence that blue economy is on not only fisheries, but without fisheries, there is no blue economy. And then, uh, based on that, I would like to start with the context of the fisheries and blue economy transformation in Indonesia. What's going on? So this is the context of the operational dividend that I use, as I mentioned previously. A system of economy with based on aquatic ecosystem, not only ocean, but including also the inland and freshwater ecosystem economy. So in the context of that, uh, I would like to uh, say, for example, the aquatic as the capital, this is the main capital of blue economy. Without aquatic system, there is no blue economy. That's why it's actually from the climate, uh, uh, was that the pollution ecosystem health is very important in the context of blue economy. But then the other aspect of the blue economy is the <laughs> social economic ecosystem integrity, human inclusive uh, ecosystem governance, etc., et including the innovation and as, as also some previously mentioned referring to the uh, innovation, technologies, and also the other knowledge of the ecosystem by the stakeholders. And in Indonesia, right now, uh, there is some transformation. Next July, I, I got information that BAPANAS, our national uh, agency for development plan, would uh, launch the blue economy transformation for the next 2045. We call it Indonesian MAS, right? Indonesia MAS, the gold period of the Indonesian for the next 20 years, uh, 2045, that the DNA of the 20 years futures actually is the blue economy. And this is actually the emerging versus established uh, sectors in the context of blue economy. So as, as I mentioned in this, or I put in the context of this screen, fisheries also is a part of the very important uh, sectors in the blue economy. And this is the context of Indonesian case. Yeah. We, we know that there is also some countries, including uh, uh, our neighbors like uh, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, as well as the Philippines, also con in, in the context of ASEAN, for example, I, I involved in the ASEAN Blue Economic Platform. They also have like a, a pl uh, platform on this blue economy and fisheries always included in the context of this uh, blue economy platform in the respective countries. And for the Indonesian transformation for the next 2045, uh, 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 transformation. This is the thing that again, fisheries is very important as the very important characteristic of the blue economy, but not only fisheries. We contact, uh, we talk about the blue economy. So this is the thing that from the archipelagic vision of our country, and then come to the context of SDGs, not only 14, but maybe mainly 12, uh, 13, 15, and other. Uh, related uh, SDGs, and then in the context of that, we need integrated uh, approach related to the uh, uh, regulation, institution, and as well as budget, and then come to the strengthen maritime vision. And we uh, already know from the government, for example, at least from the Papanas, that the new uh, uh, long-term development plan will be come to the context of the Nusantara vision. Nusantara is actually, in my perspective, so like uh, archipelagic uh, system thinking, archipelagic vision that Indonesia is more dominant of the aquatic ecosystem, but without land, there is no Nusantara. So land and aquatic, land and ocean interaction uh, platform is very important in our country. That's why the, actually the vision of our country is actually blue economy vision, put in the context of Nusantara vision and mission for the next 2045. And Back to the fisheries issues on blue economy. This is our partial contact, right? Uh, 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 what's that? Uh, 14 fisheries management area for marine. And then, uh, sorry, 11 for the marine and then 14 for the inland fisheries. This one, 
so what's what's next after we have like this this is very important for, to be to be considering this seminar that this is not only the empty space we have uh, resources we have ecosystem and human is part of that all of the space marine as well as the inland uh, fisheries management area so our responsibility actually how to deal with the managing this sustainability of fisheries within this management area so that our responsibility in that context i think uh, i put example on the context of marine fisheries management area there are many hierarchy from the ecological hierarchy to the context of the government hierarchy there is also multi stakeholder platform who is the most responsible actors related to the sustainable fisheries many of the stakeholders as sam also mentioned the stakeholders involvement is very important so this is the thing that we have to deal with the context of the governance the fisheries governance is very important to manage the resilience of the fisheries in our country for example like this this is my my very uh, uh, recent uh, quick analysis of the for example fisheries management uh, area for for marine for example i put some modified uh, what we call modified copy plot usually actually the the standard stock assessment meaning that the copy plot is only the bmsy and and emsy for example but in this context i put not only the ratio of the utilization of the fish stock but also the the economic value as the y axis then the x axis actually is the ratio if we talk about the 17 to the 2020 you know that actually we have like capman yeah ministry degree of the stock assessment 17 uh, and then the last uh, last year we have the new stock assessment uh, 2022 so when we combine there is some changes of the what we call the resilience of the stock because then uh, in the red one, uh, more than uh, 0.8 ratio, for example, because more than that, I think it's already dangerous. We know that actually the precursory approach of the reference point is uh, 0.8 as general uh, what, what biological of the fish uh, as, 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 uh, as targeted also in the SDG 14. But then in the context of the economic value, I divide into the green and the yellow, meaning that the green is the more valuable and then the yellow is less valuable if you can see the dot of that is actually the nine uh, group of species in the context of the each fmas you can see all that except 70 uh, 718 yeah because the 718 we know that it's still problematic because after we receive the new uh, permen uh, 22 uh, uh, number 1922 uh, there is no change in the stock but then if the talk about the context of the economic value then there is different what i'm trying to say is that please look at it the dot that actually the all of the most of the group of species is the red and the yellow is very very uh, small dot not less number of dot in the context of the green area meaning that actually this is the the resilience. Our our physics resilience is in 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 danger, in my my opinion. That's why actually we have to be careful with the context of this uh, stock assessment or stock resilience in the in our in our uh, perspective. So this is the thing that actually the government should consider this graph regarding to the quota, for example. There is no much uh, rooms of the fish stock actually in the context of the economic as, as well as the ecological perspective so this is the thing that we know we need managing the resource resilience in the context of our fisheries and then how how then uh, uh put in the context of managing that resilience i'm i'm and this is my last part of my talking uh, as as uh, blue economy fisheries transformation in blue economy and then the resilience and then how to manage the resilience i i introduced the actually it's not on the the new one and maybe most of you already know this what we call about the social ecological system approach the framework uh sorry in, in, in basa but actually the context of the of the uh social ecological system is that the view of that social system is part of the ecological system 
So there is some social ecological connectivities and social ecological co-evolution in the context of the uh, uh, pillars. In that context, I would like to say that actually there are four uh, as modified from Ostrom, for example, that is resource system, resource unit as ecological features, there is some ecological rule there, and then also the resource actors and resource governance as the social system, and there is some social rule there. That's why actually the genetic, as Sam mentioned, or Professor Kim, for example, mentioned on the context of the eDNA, connect in the context of resource system and resource unit. But then, not only that, that information we need in the physical management, we need social rules, we need social values, we need uh, resource actors value, we need some governance system value in the context of interaction and outcome. In that context, I try to promote that with this social ecological system approach, the managing the resilience in soil involve two things, two systems, ecological system as, well as the social system as the one integrated system or in, in some literatures mentioned that intertwin system, complex adaptive system in the context of the fisheries in our country. And the SES approach already been uh, applied in the context of aquatic system, in inland fisheries and in marine fisheries, as, as you can see in the context of this diagram, a uh, very comprehensive, we call it heuristic model, actually in the context of this comprehensive model, people and 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 that I'm very interesting with the Sam just presented on SNAP, for example, like, yes, we have to connect between the nature and people. And from my perspective, I'm using SES tools or SES framework to connect between the nature and people, both in the context of the inland fishery system, for example, in the left side, as well as in the context of marine, uh, in the context of the right side, for example, into this diagram, from the climate to the context of the resilience of the community in the coastal area. For in that context, I'm, I will uh, uh, end my, my uh, talks uh, today in the context of the application of that uh, in my lab. Uh, we have a fisheries resources uh, management lab in our faculty and uh, under the uh, Department of Aquatic Resource Management as well by uh, my college, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Charles is part of that the young scientists in our uh, uh, department that very engaged on this uh, seminar, I, I will uh, promote actually the connectivities for some like this, this multi-scale analysis of the lobster, for example, we try to develop this uh, model as, as the first identification, for example, which one is more vulnerable. Based on that, then connect to the content of the resilience dealing with the vulnerabilities of the fisheries, then we have to manage in the context of the resilient, for example, in the future. So by uh, identifying the connectivity of all of the system, then we can identify the, the gaps of the feedbacks between the social and ecological system to identify the uh, sustainability strategies, or we call actually IMS, yeah? Adaptive Management Strategies for the fisheries. And the second, uh, for example, uh, a case study uh, I did with my PhD student, for example, in the context of small scale coral fisheries in Selayar Island in South Sulawesi, for example. We try to develop the uh, systematic model of the coral uh, ecological resilience overlay with the context of the livelihood resilience. So, in that context, the uh, livelihood based governance is maximum 45%. And then the effective marine conservation management minimum is 40%. Meaning that actually we cannot say that, for example, uh, full 100% protection or zero protection is not really that. We have like more uh, detailed signs on, for example, putting the, uh, in the context of marine special planning, how much the percentage of the protected area related to the context of the ecological and socioeconomic resilience. We cannot just only depend on one ecological resilience without considering the economic or social resilience, for example. And how to combine with that? That the system uh, thinking and system uh, uh, dynamic we put of that using the that I mentioned the connectivity system diagram to put some ideas on how ecological and economic resilience for small scale fisheries in, for example, 
uh, in this context is the coral uh, fisheries in Selayar Island. So that's thing that uh, I believe uh, uh, leadership is very, very important in doing the ocean governance, including the fisheries governance, and using the uh, inclusive leadership, meaning that we have to govern or taking some ecological governance put together in the context of that uh, uh, social and economic governance at the one system what we call the social ecological system governance will be very important tools to uh, lead our uh, country as the leading archipelagic uh, country as not only the largest archipelagic society but also the leading archipelagic countries uh, for the next 2045 uh, period of our next Indonesia mass but using the visitors as the main indicators of the blue economy. Blue economy is not only fisheries, but without fisheries, there is no blue economy in our uh, very uh, largest uh, archipelagic state, uh, Indonesia, uh, our beloved country. Thank you very much, the moderator, for the uh, times and back to you, and hopefully that we can still have some fruitful discussion with Sam after this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Lucky, for the informative and comprehensive presentations. Uh, very well, ladies and gentlemen. Now we have come to the panel discussion session. And because our conference is a hybrid seminar uh, for audience in this room, uh, you can ask directly by raise your hand. And for the online participants, you can also uh, ask directly by clicking the raise hand feature or write your questions uh, in the chat box. Please mention your name and state uh, to which presenter you address your questions. So, is there any questions for our speaker? Uh, for the participants in this room? So, because uh, there's still no one asked in this room, so uh, we move to the... Um, questions in the chat box. So there's one question from uh, Ibn Sahidir to Dr. Sam. So uh, I will read the questions. Dear Dr. Sam, this may be a little bit out of context, but I would like to inquire about the World Wildlife Fund's mm -hmm. WWF general perspective on shrimp farming worldwide at present. Additionally, I am curious if there are any specific views regarding Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Sam, please, you can answer the question. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I wrote a little bit in the chat. You know, I think for WF, I can't speak to whether we have a global position about all types of shrimp farming. Um, but, you know, our strategies really do focus on a sustainable aquaculture, um, you know, as uh, we just heard from, I think, the many talks and the theme of this conference, shrimp are important, both for the shrimp themselves, their role in the ecosystem, and for the people who depend on them for the lively, their livelihoods and for the broader economy. And so what a lot of the work that we do as an organization does focus on sustainable aquaculture and focuses on the drivers of unsustainable shrimp farming. Um, so some of the uh, topics that just came up, right, with the social ecological systems and addressing governance, addressing rights around land, um, addressing sustainable livelihoods are all aspects of addressing that sustainable shrimp farming question. Um, so I think me personally, um, you know, I think the way that I see it, we need to make sure that the work we're doing in conservation and natural resource management really tries to both meet us at the reality where people are at and what's feasible, but also with the eye of trying things out now so that we can work towards something better in the future. So, you know, shrimp farming is a particularly damaging practice for the environment, um, but we need to figure out how we address it in a way that doesn't do equal damage on human livelihoods. Okay, thank you for the answer, Dr. Sam. So we will continue with the other questions. Is there any questions here for, from the participant in the room? For two of our speakers? Okay, there's one question here. 
please you can uh, state your name and to whom you address your questions okay uh, my name is please stand up yeah. My name is Diko Mulai Subekti from Equity Relationship Management 2020. Uh, permission to ask, uh, uh, what are the strategies that can can be used to implement the blue economy concept, and what is the strategy for optimizing the potential of the blue economy? Thank you. Okay, so the question is for Professor Luki, right? Uh, right. Yeah, yeah Professor Luki, is the uh, questions clear to you? Okay, yeah, please, uh, you may answer the question. Uh, the committee? Uh, yeah. The question. Yeah, uh, the sorry, because the administration actually do not allow me to unmute. Oh, I think the that procedure is very difficult, so I think uh, some, sometimes difficult to unmute myself. So thank you very much for unmute the, the thing. Yes, that's very, uh, very uh, challenging question, I think, in the context of the implementation of the blue economy. Uh, as I mentioned previously, blue economy is very not new. Yeah? Blue economy is very uh, common already in our country because our country already the aquatic, quote unquote, yeah? aquatic and ocean dominated countries. So, for the long history at Sriwijaya or Majapahit or Dema or something like that in the ancient ancient uh, uh, kingdom, already doing the blue economy actually, because the trade, for example, you know, the merchantile, the trade between the uh, Sriwijaya go to the Majapahit in Java and then from Java go to the context of Bali, Molucas, including the Philippines, our network country, all of that is already blue economy. That's why actually the blue economy is not really uh, new in our country. But then, as I mentioned, the blue economy is emerging economic platform. Emerging meaning that we already have all the blue economy, but then we need some refreshment. We need some new spirit that actually Indonesia is the largest archipelagic state. In the context of Indonesia, I mean, I mean not, I'm not talking that the other uh, 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 blue country uh, doesn't have the uh, similar spirit, but then, the strategy that I would like to mention is not right now. Already in the Indonesian government try to develop. We will develop the roadmap of the blue economy that now already uh, prepared by the by the uh, government. But not only the context of the roadmap of the development plan, we also consider the context of the social ecological system. What is the really important of blue economy? Aquatic ecosystem. Right? What is the challenge and 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 threat of for the climate uh, for the aquatic ecosystem? We have to defend on that because we thought the very healthy or I think healthy ecosystem there is no blue economy. In that context, a strategy is not only the development plan in the context of economic point of view, but also in the context of the ecosystem governance. So, my uh, straightforward uh, answer for the very strategic and challenging question of the audience is actually. Let's uh, uh, waiting for the roadmap, waiting for the government plans of the blue economy. And after that, let's do and uh, let's uh, what that uh, uh, things about the implementation strategy of that. For example, the three things, yeah. Regulation perspective, we call regulation framework. The, the second one is actually the institutional framework. And then the, the last one is actually the financial uh, framework. In this three strategic implementation scheme is very important for our country. Regulation. What is the regulation that we need to put some more uh, more powerful black economy? The second one, institutional framework. Many of the institutions are actually coming to the context of the black economy and who is the dirigent? Who is the leaders of the context of black economy movement? This is also the second strategy that we need to be considered. Last one, the blue financing strategy the uh, budget uh, framework who will be finance the blue economy from 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 where from where actually the finance sources in that context the three pillar of strategy uh, regulation strategy institutional strategy as well as the finance strategy will be very important for a country related to the context of blue economy 
I think uh, we can discuss later on with the three uh, pillars of strategy for each strategy, for the, uh, more detailed strategy of that. Uh, we can discuss in the later, uh, in the next uh, or the other time for that. Thank you very much for the next, uh, for the question. Okay, thank you, Professor Lucky. Uh, I think we still have time for one more question. So uh, I will read uh, one question uh, to uh, Dr. Sam from Rahmawati. So the question is, um, I would like to ask about the conservation practice that has been done by WWF or related government to cope genetically changes in squid, which is caused by increasing capture activity. Dr. Sam, you may answer the questions. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Dr. Sam. I had to unmute. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Yes, this is a this is a really great question, um, and you know I think this gets back at this um, understanding the whole system, right? So genetic changes that are wrought by fishing pressure um, come from lots of different places, and so if we want to address the genetic changes, we need to address these bigger drivers of fishing pressure. So, you know, there's that part of it, but I think in general, when we talk about the explicit actions of WF or other conservation organizations or of government agencies, I do think a lot of fisheries management um, and the work that's happening there to support it does focus on adaptive capacity in general. Um, that adaptive capacity isn't just defined by genetic diversity um, or, you know, rapid changes in uh, genetic um, uh, composition um, and what those changes might be from, um, but focuses more on trying to uh, ensure the overall health of that particular population or of that particular species. Um, so I think this gets back to sort of that movement in natural resource management around ecosystem-based uh, management um, around sort of whole systems management to look at these things as holistic whole and take an integrative approach. Um, you know, I think obviously we could be using a lot more genetic data um, and trying to understand changes to connectivity patterns, changes to both the demographic and genetic connectivity. And we are starting to see that. Um, I think particularly in some land-based work um, in, in wildlife corridors, but I have not seen it to the same degree in uh, marine systems and particularly fishery systems. Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, answer of Dr. Sam. So apparently uh, there's still half some questions left, but unfortunately, uh, due to the limited time, we need to end our discussion session for today. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we finally have uh, come to the end of this uh, session, and I would like to say thank you to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Samantha Cheng and Professor Luki uh, Adrianto, for a very interesting and informative talk and also to the all participants for the active participation. Please uh, give a round of applause for the invited speaker and for you all. Thank you and good morning. Thank you very much once again to Dr. Samantha from WWF USN and also Prof. Luki from FPIK IPB Indonesia and also thank you all moderator. Ibu Dian Pertiwi MSI and we would like to ask you to stay on the stage and also Dr. Samantha and Professor Luki please kindly stay on your screen because we would like uh, our organizing committee would like to present token of appreciation the first e-certificate is given to Dr. Samantha from WWF USA Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Samantha Cheng, PhD uh, from WWF USA. The second is certificate is given to Professor Dr. Insinyur Luki Andrianto MSG from FPIK IPB Indonesia.
Once again, thank you very much, Professor Lucky Andrianto, and kindly be invited Vice Chairman of the Indonesian Etiology Society, Professor Dr. Insinyur Jumanto, MSc, and also Chairman of Organizing Committee, Ibu Dr. Nyoman Dati Pertami, to present the tokens to our moderator. Well, for the next, please kindly take your position for taking the picture. And also, I uh, would like to invite Dr. Samantha and Professor Luki to take a position for taking the pictures. Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, please give big round of applause to our panelists and also moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Samantha and Professor Luki. Thank you very much, Ibu Dian Pertiwi as our moderator and also Professor Jumanto and Ibu Dr. Dati Pertami. Well, this thing is guest participant, ladies and gentlemen. The next session will be a parallel session three which will be provided on the second floor of this building. And I'm kindly invite online participation, participant to be on our breakout room to join the parallel session three. And after the parallel session three, we would like to invite you to enjoy the lunch, which will be provided in front of this main room. And after lunch, we will start the fourth session, which is the poster presentation also in front of this main room and our last uh, agenda today is closing ceremony which will be provided in this main room so after uh, fourth session which is uh, the poster presentation please kindly back to this main room to continue our last agenda thank you
offline poster, please go to the poster location immediately because the offline poster session will start soon. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, presenting as uh, the my uh, research. The topic is my research uh, mangrove uh, biomass uh, sequence precision in Benua Bay. The background is uh, my research is uh, global warming. Uh, uh, has been believed to be one uh, of a source uh, uh, of disaster. Uh, global warming is uh, a cause uh, of in imbalance uh, in ecosystem as a result of uh, uh, gas uh, increased gas emission. Gas emission is uh, uh, the last uh, decades uh, have a double offer from uh, 1,500 million ton per year to 2,900 million ton per year. Uh, the uh, extensive uh, mangrove in Bali in uh, Benua Bay, uh, which uh, an area about uh, 1,000 uh, uh, 300 uh, hectare or uh, 30 percent of uh, area mangrove in Bali. The ability of mangrove in uh, carbon and storage uh, is uh, three times greater than uh, uh, other forests. Yeah. Uh, and uh, ability of uh, mangrove uh, uh, in carbon absorb and storage is indicated in uh, 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 biomass value. Uh, the uh, 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 the 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 uh, uh, this research uh, in conducted uh, 
uh, in Benua Bay uh, by on to time yeah and the time the first time in Augustus uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, 2022 and second time in uh, March uh, 2023 and the data collect uh, uh, our uh, species uh, identification three density uh, sampling density total diameter and canopy cover and result and uh, uh, this result and conclusion is uh, my result is uh, uh, six uh, species were found uh, in the area uh, of study and then the uh, biomassa yeah, uh, was found uh, in the second monitoring of ton per hectare and then uh, uh, was found uh, increase the average of uh, biomass uh, for six months is uh, 1,315 uh, ton per year per hectare and then the 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 the, the increase in uh, biomass uh, biomass directly proportional with uh, increase in diameter uh, uh, at uh, debris uh, height or uh, dbh uh, this uh, my presentation okay thank you Uh, thank you for the opportunity question. Actually, this is my student works uh, with the title Morphological Character and Molecular Identification of Thirteen Brim Nemipterus in Yogyakarta Coastal Waters. Uh, Thirteen Brim, or we call uh, Kurisi, is the unimportant and potential fisher resource, and then high economy for uh, fish commodity. And uh, one of the challenges in the study about the diversity is Nemipterus, and there are many, many species of Nemipterus, but uh, we cannot uh, know what the exactly inhabit in a particular uh, water. So we want to study about the Nemipterus, uh, what kind of species in this uh, uh, waters in Yogyakarta coastal water. Uh, and the first sample we collected from September to December 2021 in the Baron uh, landing uh, fish landing ports. Then we conducted uh, in the two uh, method. One is the morphological identification following the Russell and Russell and Ho in 2017, and uh, we its uh, fish sample was measured 20 22 morphologic uh, morphometric character. Then we also con uh, five merek mesti characters and, and therefore uh, then we conducted a molecular identification following uh, uh, by uh, PCR, the NAPCR method by direct sequencing with the target is cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 and the result and discussion uh, by the morphological identification we found uh, two species uh, namely Nemiterus sucilatus and Nemiterus gracilis and the name is uh, not common because we always call Nemiterus japonicus or Nemiterus uh, virgatus but we found only two Nemiterus sucilatus and uh, Nemiterus gracilis and we only found uh, two species uh, uh, sorry two individuals that uh, identified uh, as Nemiterus uh, gracilis but mostly Nemipterus uh, was Nemipterus sugilatus. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, 
picture uh, figure for Neptunus sugilatus and Neptunus garis and the identical based on the morphology. And this is on the meristic character of Neptunus uh, coats and the coast, Yogyakarta coastal water. You can uh, see in this. Uh, uh, this is uh, our study. Then the compare with a uh, uh, similar character by Russell and Ho. And this is for uh, Nem Nemipterus gracilis. So I think there are only uh, small differences between Nemipterus uh, sugilatus and Nemipterus gracilis. Maybe only on the number of squama in the linea lateralis. Then we uh, conducted PCR, uh, PCA, uh, principal component analysis test uh, analysis, and we found that uh, the uh, Nemipterus sugilatus and Nemipterus gracilis uh, shown the very very uh, similar based on the morpho, uh, morphometric characters. Then after that we conducted a molecular uh, identification. And this is the summary of morphological and molecular identification of many meteors caught in Yogyakarta coastal waters. So, uh, based on the morphological identification, the, the, the first sample uh, identify as Nemipterus gracilis, uh, number two Nemipterus sugilatus, and number three Nemipterus uh, sugilatus. But by molecular identification, actually the Nemipterus gracilis uh, was identified as Nemipterus sugilatus. So in this uh, figure you can see in the molecular phylogenic tree showing the genetic relationship among Nemipterus and the found in the Yogyakarta coastal water and other location and also the odd group uh, para colopsis uh, akatame from uh, Taiwan. As uh, the summary or conclusion, uh, the, we found that based on the molecular, only Nemipterus sugilatus found in the Yogyakarta coastal water. Thank you very much. Check. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Fernanda. I'm from Ifisiary, so I will uh, tell uh, you all about the uh, ORP application in the stream farming. Uh, so, water quality management is crucial in stream farming as it directly impacts the stream health and productivity. However, assessing water quality uh, can be complex, requiring uh, timely analysis and decision making for giving effective treatment. RP as an indicator uh, for, of a substance uh, tendency to oxidize or reduce another substance uh, shows promise uh, as a parameter for summarizing water quality in stream farming. By having a single parameter that provides a summary of water quality status, we can facilitate efficient uh, decision making and rapid action in response uh, to changes to the changes of the water quality itself. Well, ORP is commonly used for assessing the pond uh, soil sediment. Uh, this study specifically focuses on the water, uh, the ORP of water. So we collected uh, the ORP data um, at one minute intervals over 60 days at our farm in Cipatuja, Tasikmalaya, by placing a stationary probe of ORP matter. Uh, and the results shown. Uh, that ORP values may not have a significant uh, a direct correlation with the other parameters uh, and there's also found a complex scattered pattern uh, for the before and after treatment analysis. In co conclusion, uh, ORP values are better suited 
for controlling and uh, monitoring specific system rather than being uh, used as a sole parameter for inter interpreting the overall pond dynamics. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So um, this is actually a collaboration research between Universitas Brawijaya and also uh, Ministry of uh, Marine and uh, Fisheries Affairs. Um, so the title is uh, ENSO and IOD Impact on Tuna Fisheries in Short Indian Ocean. Uh, my name is uh, Sambah. I'm from uh, the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, uh, Universitas Brawijaya. So the, the, the urgencies of um, this, this study is consists of three issues. The first one is currently Indonesia um, planning agency or we call by Bapenas. Now they are uh, preparing for the root map, blue economy root map for 2024, uh, which is um, they have two targets. The first one is uh, to increase economically um, or um, the national income, to increase the national income from the maritime, uh, maritime uh, sector up to 17.5% from the, uh, from the fishery sector. And the second one, ecologically, we have to make sure that our, um, our fisheries uh, resources is in sustainability term. And the, 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 the second urgency is um, we know that we have a lack of data about um, the migration of uh, pelagic fish, especially for the economically um, fish uh, like uh, tuna and also another uh, species. Uh, based on that uh, urgencies, we, we, we know that Indonesia support more than 16% from the world total production from the tuna of, of the world. So, um, and also um, based on the academic uh, background, we know that uh, the habitat of uh, fish, or especially the habitat of uh, pelagic fish, is indirectly influenced by not only oceanography factor, but also climate, climate uh, uh, effect. We know that in the Pacific uh, side, we have uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, and also in the southern part of um, Equator, we have uh, Indian Ocean Depool. And indirectly, we believe that this both uh, phenomena affect indirectly to our uh, habitats, not only for tuna, but also maybe for the um, high migratory uh, species like marine mammal. So our research aim is um, to know or to determine the effect of climate uh, anomalies, uh, such as uh, ENSO and IOD, uh, to the productivity of one of the species uh, of tuna, uh, yellowfin tuna, especially in Indian, Indian Ocean. So um, we collected uh, more than 400 points of fishing ground, so around the, the area of um, Malang fishing port, or in the southern parts of East Java, we collected from 466 points of uh, fishing ground, and we collected the catch data of yellowfin tuna, from 2017 until 2021. And also we compare with the uh, oceanographic parameter data, uh, such as sea surface temperature, chlorophyll A, and also um, we, we also applied uh, NINO 3.4 data and also the pool mode index. And um, we analyze all the parameter using generalized uh, additive model and in the in the end of this um, research we want to create a potential map or potential distribution map of the yellowfin tuna especially so in conclude um, from tuna cats uh, dynamic we will show the tuna tuna cats dynamic um, for the years of 2017 until 2021 and also 
how about the dynamic of variable or, or variability of oceanographic uh, vari uh, parameters um, consists of uh, SST sea surface temperature and also uh, sea surface chlorophyll and also we identify the ENSO and IOD during the period of 2017 and also 2021 and using the correlation and game analysis um, we do some uh, standard analysis to know which parameter that affect to the distribution of uh, yellowfin tuna and uh, the, the, the final one um, 2023 we want to produce um, a, dynam a dynamic map of uh, yellowfin tuna fishing ground this is the result so from the correlation analysis and also general, general generalized uh, additive model analysis uh, we found that the variability of SST and also SSC, the surface chlorophyll, was influenced by uh, IOD phenomena uh, and not significantly, uh, significantly uh, influenced by uh, the ENSO phenomena. And from the 15 GAM models, uh, we, we found that um, the model of consists of or the combination of chlorophyll A data and also ENSO phenomena affect the dynamic of tuna cats. This is, uh, we know this from the, the, the value of AIC and also DE value. Um, this is some uh, Hofmuller uh, diagram that we know that the pattern of the SST and also the pattern of SSC is inverse. It means that sometimes the increasing of temperature followed by the decreasing of um, chlorophyll A and followed by the highest number of the cats but the pattern is not so clear so um, the, 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 the result is not so significant, not so significant uh, statistically and also here we can see this, this one is the combination or the analysis between cats, yellowfin cats and also the pool mode index um, Almost similar with, with, with uh, what we, we found here that uh, almost the atmo atmospheric uh, parameter and also oceanographic parameter affect indirectly to the distribution of the tuna or the, to the distribution of the uh, especially yellowfin tuna. In conclusion, the phenomena of climate anomalies and um, oceanographic condition in the water indirectly affect fish cats through the food chain process. It means there are a time lag between the increasing of um, oceanographic parameters and the productivity of the cats. Time lag, and based on our research 10 or five years ago, the time lags may be from one until five years. So we thank you so much to Ocean Color and also PSL NOAA for uh, providing uh, oceanographic data and also NINO 3.4 and also uh, DMI data and Pondok Data uh, Fishing Port in Malang for supporting uh, tuna catch data from 2017 until 2021 and also uh, this research is a part of uh, Hibah Penelitian Unggulan in our university. Thank you so much. Yes, you can call me Rian. Rian. Yeah, Florita van der Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the time and for the. Uh, uh, in this uh, day, I will to a presentation my mini review. Uh, this mini review is uh, contribute for my dissertation, and the title is the potential of uh, lactic acid bacteria or BAL to control histamine production in seafood product uh, as a mini review. In effort to maintain the stability of demand of uh, uh, seafood consumption, 
uh, the relevant authorities must be aware alarming increase in case of uh, food poisoning. Uh, in this uh, in this mini review, we are control for the histamine contamination in the fishery of product. As we know, uh, histamine can be uh, some disease can be like uh, allergic yeah, if the human consumption like a uh, fishery of tuna. And then, uh, however, some of this way uh, can trigger health problem. Uh, some people can get uh, allergen uh, like uh, like uh, tongue can be allergenic, and then uh, they need to eat uh, antihistamine uh, to uh, again to from biological product which identically have a good uh, efficiency and then uh, easy to apply. So we need uh, to find uh, biological control uh, like uh, lactic acid bacteria. Uh, however, in the company, uh, they have uh, they have to they have a strategy to prevent the histamine, like a lower uh, lower uh, temperature, and then uh, in the scientists we need to find uh, one control like uh, use uh, bac lactic acid bacteria. Uh, lactic acid bacteria, as we know, to produce histamine, uh, some uh, lactic acid bacteria also have histamine. You can see on the table, uh, some of the lactic acid bacteria also produce histamine. So they can uh, increase the histamine on the seafood uh, product. So we need to select uh, the lactic acid bacteria which no produce the histamine. So we can uh, tandem with the bacteria uh, BPH, bacteria produce histamine. So we can uh, we can increase the we can increase the we can to prevent the histamine to control the histamine from the bacteria uh, produce histamine. Uh, you can see on the table D, lactic bacteria bacteria acid have been highlighted in recent in recent years for being a breakdown a biogenic amine by producing amine oxide uh, enzyme. So the uh, species like uh, Pediococcus and uh, Pediococcus and uh, Plantarum have been isolated on my dissertation uh, to uh, to to suppress bacteria potential histamine. So if we can find more bacteria uh, less lactic acid bacteria, uh, we can use uh, to control the bacteria histamine production in uh, seafood contamination. Okay, in the last my presentation, the conclusion is histamine pro producing bacteria has been successfully isolated from various uh, seafood product. Uh, in this, uh, in my dissertation, I have been uh, finally isolation the bacteria potential histamine isolated from the yellowfin tuna and also from big eye. And then uh, I try to I, I try to put a bacteria uh, lactic acid on the histamine tuna and then we are we are control the increase the of histamine. I think that's all. Thank you for the time. Yeah, thank you. All presenters have present their uh, poster. Uh, thank you again for all of the poster presenter. Uh, so today's session poster, we we end this uh, poster session for today. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the thank you. Welcome back to the second international seminar on fish and fisheries science is 2023. And now we are getting closer to the end of this seminar, but now we are entering to the door prize session. All right, uh, it's time for uh, the raffle draw where you can uh, win some exciting prizes. And the draw is taken from the abstract number. Once again, the draw is taken from the abstract number. So ladies and gentlemen, please remember your uh, own abstract number. Uh, we have two prizes in the first session of door prize to give away today. And uh, also we have two prizes in the second session of door prize. And uh, to raffle the draw, we will use spinner application. So the committee, please be ready with the spinner. All right, for the first winner, let us count down together in three, two, one, go. All right, congratulations for the first winner. The number, the abstract number is FMG02. All right, we move on to the second prizes, second prize. And let us count down together for the second prize in the first session of door prize. In three, two, one, go. All right, congratulations for the second winner. The abstract number is FMG05. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this uh, door prize will uh, ask by the committee to claim uh, the prize. So once again, please rem remember your uh, abstract number. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to the next uh, agenda for today, let us now enjoy a special performance, once again a special performance named Joget Bumbung. All right, be ready, ladies and gentlemen. Joget Bumbung is a traditional Balinese dance performance intended as entertainment for the community and also for tourists. The dance is one of the nine Balinese dances proposed to be the World Cultural Heritage by UNESCO. The word joget is defined as movement or dance. Meanwhile, bumbung is a local term which means bamboo. This is a dance or movement accompanied by bamboo music. So ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy joget bumbung dance. <laughs>
Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, please give big round of applause for the dancer. That was Joget Bumbung. Once again, Joget Bumbung is uh, a traditional Balinese dance. And now uh, we move on to the second session of Door Prize. I would like to uh, ask the committee to, to uh, raffle the draw. On the second session of door prize, we uh, also have two, prize, two prizes to uh, who uh, the, for two winners. Okay, let me start to uh, raffle the draw. In three, two, one, go. All right, the first winner of the second session door prize is AGO58. And the last prize for the second session door prize that we count down together in three, two, one, go. Congratulations for FMG15 or 15. Congratulations once again to the winner of our door prize. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, we are informed you before, there will be the best award ceremony before the closing session. And now we come to announce the winners of each category. The first category is the best oral presenters. The best oral presenter in room one is Hilda Mardiana. Congratulations, Hilda Mardiana. The best oral presenter in room two goes to Nyoman Giri Putra. The next one, the best oral presenter in room 3 is Sekar Larasati. All right. The best oral presenter uh, in room 4 is Saiful Ahmad Tauladani. Congratulations. And the last one, the best oral presenter in room 5 is Novalia Rahmawati. Congratulations once again to the best oral uh, presenter and I would like to invite the winner to come to the stage.
online. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the next category. The next category is the best online poster presenter. The best poster presenter. The best poster presenter in room one is Diana Arfiati. The best poster presenter in room two is Woro Hastuti. Next best poster presenter in room three is Henderite El Ohi. The best poster presenter in room four is Husna Husna. And the last one, best pre best poster presenter in room five is Han Na Jang. Congratulations to all winners, best poster presenter. The next one is the best offline poster presenter. The best offline poster presenter. This category goes to Abu Bakar Sambah. And the last category, ladies and gentlemen, this is the special award. Special word, best undergraduate student presenter. The best undergraduate student presenter goes to Nimade Dwiyan Dwiyanita Soka. Once again, Nimade Dwiyanita Soka. Once again. Congratulations to all uh, winner in best oral presenter, best poster presenter, best poster presenter offline, and also best student presenter. Is Abu Bakar Sambah here? Okay, Abu Bakar Sambah, the best poster presenter, please come to the stage. And also Nimade Dwiyanita Soka. And to present the appreciation, allow me to invite the Chairman of Organizing Committee, Ibu Dr. Nyomandati Pertami, once again to present a token of appreciation. Thank you and congratulations once again to Abu Bakar Sambah, best poster presenter, and thank you also Ibu Dr. Dati Pertami. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have now arrived at the last session of the second international seminar on fish and fishery sciences 2023. And to begin the closing ceremony, let us now hear a speech. From the Dean of Marine Science and Fisheries Udayana University, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Insinyur Iwayan Nuarse, MSE. The stage is yours.
Good afternoon, Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen who are attending offline and online. In conclusions, the International Seminar on Peace and Fisheries Agencies has been an enriching and an enlightening event, bringing together expert researchers and enthusiasts from around the world to delve into the fascinating realm on fish and fisheries. Throughout the seminars, we witnessed the exchange of valuable knowledge, cutting-edge research findings, and innovative approach in the field. The seminar has provided a platform for exploring diverse topics, including fish biology, aquaculture, fisheries management, conservation, and sustainable practices. The discussions and presentations have led lights on the challenges facing our aquatic ecosystem and the importance of responsible fisheries management for their future. By collaborating and sharing our experience, we have gained fresh insights into the complexities of the peace and fisheries sciences, discovering new methodologies, technologies, and strategies for sustainable fish, fishing practice, habitat preservation, and the protections biodiversity. Furthermore, this seminar as forested international corporations, promoting global partnership in research, conservation efforts, and knowledge dissemination. The connections made here will extend beyond the seminar serving as foundations for continued collaborations and progress in the fish and fisheries science field. As we, as, as we differ from the seminars, let us carry out the, the knowledge gained and the connect, connections made to our respective fields and communities. Let us try to implement sustainable practices advocated for re responsible fisheries management and contribute to the preservation and well-being of our aquatic ecosystem. I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers, speakers, presenters, sponsorship, and attendees for their valuable contributions, passionate discussions, and commitment to advancing space and fisheries sciences. Together, we can make a positive difference in the world, ensuring the future abundance and sustainability of our aquatic resources. Thank you and best wish for continued success in the next event. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Nuarsa, for the speech. And ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, I would like to invite the Vice Chairman of the Indonesian Etiology Society, Professor Dr. Insinyur Jumanto MSc, to deliver his closing remarks for all of us. Professor Jumanto, the stage is yours.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, distinguished guests, esteemed participants, valued contributors, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Today, we gather here for closing ceremony of the International Seminar on Fish and Fisheries. Sciences. It has been an extraordinary journey of knowledge of acting, collaboration and exploration within fish and fishery science. On the first day, 320 people attended the second international seminar on fish and fishery science. Consists of 144 participants, 131 oral presentation, and 45 committee. On the last day, there were 161 participants, 74 oral presenters, 14 poster presentations, and 38 committees. Over the past two days, we have witnessed the remarkable dedication and patience you have brought to this seminar. Throughout this event, we have delved into a wide range of topics from sustainable fisheries management to innovative aquaculture practices, from the impact on the climate change on fish population to the preservation of marine sea ecosystem. Our discussion has been enriching, enlightening, and provoking, shedding light on the challenges and opportunities to the life ahead. We extend, we extend our heartfelt appreciation to all the researchers, scientists, scholars, industry professionals, and policymakers who have shared their expertise and insight with us. You invaluable contributor contribution have significantly enriched our understanding on fish and fishery sciences. The depth of the knowledge and the breadth of perspective shared during this seminar have been truly remarkable. We also express our deepest gratitude to the organizing committee, volunteers, and sponsors for their unwavering support and dedication. The tireless effort behind the science have ensured the smooth execution of this seminar creating a conductive environment for meaningful acting and collaboration. As we reflect upon the accomplishment of this seminar, it is essential to acknowledge the significance of international cooperation in addressing the pressing issues facing our ocean and aquatic resources. The challenges we face are global in nature and their demand collective action and collaborative solution. Let us strive to build upon the connection made here, fostering partnership and networking and will transcend borders and facilitate the exchange of knowledge and best practices. In closing, we want to emphasize that this seminar is not merely an endpoint, but a stepping stone Toward further advancements in fish and fishery sciences. The knowledge shared to ideas, spark, and the relationship brought during this event will undoubtedly pave the way for groundbreaking research, sustainable practices, and effective policies that will shape the future of our ocean. On behalf of the organizing committee, we extend our sincere appreciation to each and every one of you for your active participation and enjoyment in this seminar. We hope that the insights gained and the connection established will continue to inspire and propel us forward on our shared journey toward a better understanding and stewardship and of our fish and fisheries resources. 
Thank you all for your outstanding contribution and we look forward for future collaboration and the relation of more sustainable and thriving future for fish and fishery sciences. See you in the next uh, third ISFFS on 5 to 6 June 2025 in Yogyakarta City. And this city is very interesting for you to be there. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, thank you very much, Professor Jumanto, for your closing remarks. And this also marks the end of the second international seminar on fish and fishery sciences 2023. Thank you very much for your presence and contribution of extraordinary thought over this past two days. And I apologize if there are any mistakes that I said or did, either inten uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Once again, I'm the STID. Thank you very much and see you on the third international seminar on fish and fishery sciences 2023. Good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi, Santi, Santi Om.